بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سو سید مشہور احمد ایم انٹرنیشنل کارڈیولوجسٹ مورس ہاسپٹل اینڈ کلینک انسٹرکٹر ان ریش یونیورسٹی ہاسپٹل سو دا ٹو ڈیز پریزنٹیشن اباؤٹ کارنیاٹک ڈیزیز سو ان اڈلس دی دی ڈیفینیشن آف کارنیاٹک ڈیزیز از نیروئنگ آف دی کارنیاٹ corny arteries due to build up of cholesterol plaque, uh, a process called atherosclerosis. But there are other congenital corneal disease which we usually don't see in adults, uh, such as uh, anomalous origin of uh, uh, left corneal artery from the pulmonary artery, what we call L-kappa. Uh, those patients have uh, symptoms at the very early part of their life, uh, such as heart failure and angina. And, uh, Uh, they don't reach to the adult life until uh, the, the anomalies can be corrected. So <clears throat> another uh, uh, congenital coronary disease is the anomalous origin of uh, left coronary artery from the right coronary cusp. And uh, the left uh, coronary artery travel between the aorta and pulmonary artery. And due to the pulsatile movement of the pulmonary artery and aorta, uh, it caused intermittent compression of the coronary artery, uh, resulting in the angina. Uh, but again, those patients we usually don't see in adults. So in adults, uh, the definition of coronary disease is the uh, uh, atherosclerotic uh, coronary disease, which means the uh, buildup of cholesterol plaque inside the coronary vessels. So the epidemiology of uh, coronary disease, uh, uh, it is one of the leading causes of uh, death uh, worldwide. Uh, 3.8 million men and 3.4 million women die each year from uh, this condition. Uh, this is the only data I got in, from Pakistan, that in Pakistan, the mortality of coronary disease is 410 uh, people out of uh, 100,000 uh, can die from coronary heart disease. Uh, this is the pathophysiology of uh, coronary disease. So there are multiple theories involved, uh, but uh, the, the in general, to we think there is an injury to the intima of the coronary vessel, which uh, cause uh, 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 inflammation and uh, then it can cause the deposition of cholesterol plaque. Uh, in the past, we also thought that this could be due to the infection, uh, such as mycoplasma infection. And in the past, we used to give antibiotic and prednisone, but uh, uh, it proven that it is most likely is not because of infection, most likely a chronic inflammatory response due to some form of injury. And the triggers which can cause injury to the vessel include smoking, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. So when the injury happened uh, the, into the intima of the vessel, it caused deposition of uh, smooth muscles uh, from the media, as well as deposition of macrophages in that area. And uh, the macrophages and lymphocyte uh, 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 engulf deep uh, Um, uh, lipids increase in their size, uh, and it also release some chemicals, so which cause uh, migration and proliferation of smooth muscles in that area, and that's how the cholesterol plaque increase in thickness. So this is the uh, cross-sectional view of uh, some of the vessels on the extreme uh, uh, upper side of the uh, upper left side. You can see the normal vessel. Uh, On the upper right side, uh, you can see the vessel which has an injury resulting in deposition of cholesterol plaque. And gradually the cholesterol plaque increase uh, in size uh, resulting in narrowing of the vessel. So three possible scenarios. Uh, uh, if the cholesterol plaque continues to increase in thickness, it gradually causes uh, narrowing of the vessel, uh, what we call corneal artery stenosis. And uh, those patients usually have symptoms of stable angina. In some uh, cases, uh, uh, the cholesterol plaque rupture and uh, all the debris inside the plaque spill into the vessel. And that can initiate the, uh, uh, the coagulation cascade and the blood clot form inside the vessel. If it's a small blood clot, uh, clot which we call a white uh, uh, clot, if it, if it develop, uh, those patients usually do not have complete blockage of the vessel. And those patients develop non-ST segment elevation myocardial function. It usually happens in diabetic pupils. Uh, if the clot burden is, uh, is uh, significant, it can cause complete occlusion of the vessel. 
Uh, this results in ST segment elevation micro function. Uh, the, the red clot usually happens in smokers. So these are some of the presentation of uh, coronary heart disease. If the, if the plaque buildup of coronary stenosis due to plaque buildup is not significant, patient usually remains symptomatic. If the stenosis increase in, uh, increases, then patient can develop chronic stable angina. If the cholesterol plaque eroded or rupture, uh, it can result in unstable coronary artery disease, what we call acute coronary syndrome. Sometimes the stenosis gradually increase uh, and uh, it results in chronic low blood supply to the heart muscles, causing weakness of the heart muscles uh, and cardiomyopathy. Uh, which can result in heart failure. Sometimes uh, the cholesterol plaque ruptures suddenly in one of the major vessels, causing a massive microinfarction and sudden death. So this is one of the definition of uh, angina pectoris, which uh, usually they ask you. The angina pectoris means imbalance uh, in the oxygen supply and demand. Um, so the chronic uh, atherosclerosis causes stenosis of the vessel decreases blood flow to the myocardium. And when the patient exercises, so it could be physical exertion or emotional exertion. Uh, in those cases, uh, uh, the patient become tachycardic and have a high blood pressure. In those conditions, the uh, uh, heart need to more uh, blood and more oxygen. And uh, as soon as there's a stenosis, uh, 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 the coronary vessel unable to supply adequate amount of, adequate amount of blood flow. Uh, this is also in the release of lactic acid and other chemicals. Um, and those chemicals and those inflammatory markers stimulate the nerve fibers and resulting in chest pain. So the angina pectoris is imbalanced between oxygen supply and demand. Uh, this is the same mechanism happened in the patient's severely anemic. Uh, due to low red, red blood cells, uh, the uh, coronary vessel unable to supply adequate uh, oxygen and blood flow to the heart, resulting in angina. Now, there's a big article published in New England Journal of Medicine in 1992, in which uh, uh, they interviewed a significant number of patients who, who came with acute coronary syndrome, and uh, the, then they categorized the common symptoms uh, of presentation of acute coronary syndrome. Uh, most of those patients were men, so uh, this, the typical symptom which we uh, said are the typical symptoms of angina usually are the symptoms which commonly happen in men. So the typical symptoms of, of angina include burning, pressure, or heaviness in the chest, or to the uh, retrosternal area, or to the left arm or jaw, uh, usually associated with some vagal signs, such as diaphoresis, nausea, and vomiting. Sometimes a uh, patient can have only shortness of breath. That's why it is also called angina equivalent. Now, Women have some different symptoms of uh, angina, such as uh, uh, pain between their shoulder blades or pressure between their shoulder blades, uh, or pain in the lower part of the chest or upper abdomen, associated with uh, some dizziness and, and, and lightheadedness. Uh, sometimes extreme fatigue or depression could be a sign of coronary heart disease in women. Now, this is one of the clinical classification we use commonly in patients who are coming with the typical symptoms of angina. So, and depends upon this clinical classification, we treat them differently. Um, if the patient have typical symptoms of angina on strenuous activities, they're considered having functional classification one or Canadian classification one angina symptoms. If it slightly uh, affect their ordinary activities and improve uh, with the changing their activities or rest, then they're considered to have uh, uh, class two symptoms, if can affect their daily activities, or if the symptoms happen at rest, then they are considered to have unstable angina. So the uh, functional classification three and four symptoms could be categorized having unstable angina symptoms. Now, the this slide I I, I put it because I want to define uh, one more uh, type of angina, what we call Prince metal angina. Uh, it is different from other angina because uh, the the, uh, uh, the pathophysiology is uh, coronary artery spasm. Those patients, uh, when you do the angiogram, you don't see any uh, obstructive stenosis uh, in the coronary arteries. 
uh, mostly those patients have uh, vasospasm. It usually happens in women or men who are heavy smoker. And uh, the symptoms can happen at rest, or but mostly happen at uh, rest, but can happen on exertion. Uh, and they usually have ST7 elevation and depression transiently at the time of symptoms, and usually relief after the symptoms improve. But if you do the angiogram, uh, coronary angiogram, you don't see any obstructive disease on those patients. Now, the main uh, reason we're doing all these presentation is because of this slide, acute uh, coronary syndrome, which is the most uh, important uh, presentation of uh, coronary disease. And there are three types of uh, acute coronary syndrome. So uncivil angina, non-ST segment elevation myocardial function and acute ST segment elevation myocardial function. And we'll go one by one. So the unstable angina is, is an angina which can occur at rest and last for more than 20 minutes. Or angina which is occurring at uh, daily activities affecting the daily lifestyle and can last up to 20 minutes. It is usually associated uh, with uh, ST segment depression or elevation or T wave inversion, but the cardiac enzymes remain negative. Uh, sometimes the any crescendo angina, which means increased frequency or duration of uh, angina, uh, which uh, started recently, also classifies as having unstable angina. Now, another uh, uh, presentation of acute coronary syndrome and is non ST segment elevation function. And simply, if the patient who have unstable angina symptoms and have elevated cardiac enzyme then it is considered to having a, a acute non ST segment elevation myocardial function. In the past, we used to call them a subendocardial infarct, but lately we call them non ST segment elevation myocardial function. And the, the most dangerous, most uh, important presentation of acute coronary syndrome is acute ST segment elevation myocardial function, which means uh, the typical symptoms of angina associated with ST segment elevation or new onset left on the branch block associated with elevated cardiac enzymes. As I said, you know, in the past we used to define acute coronary syndrome with two categories: uh, transmitter and non-transmitter myocardial infarction. A transmitter infarction means uh, the uh, infarction affect the entire thickness of the myocardium up to the endocardium, and they usually have Q waves and non-transmitter which do not uh, extend the entire thickness of the myocardium and they usually have uh, uh, no Q-wave. But uh, uh, it is uh, term come to know that sometimes non-transmitter myocardial function still have Q-waves uh, and sometimes uh, transmitter function may not have Q-wave or ST elevation. So that's why the, this, uh, this definition is almost uh, obsolete. Now, how we diagnose patients with acute coronary syndrome, um, uh, where we do seal leakages, we do seal cardiac markers, uh, we do immediate angiography, for coronary angiography in patients who are having ST elevation microfunction, function, patients who are having non ST elevation microfunction function or unstable angina with high risk features, in those patients we can do angiography up to 24 to 48 hours. Now, this is for patients who have an acute coronary syndrome and patients who do not have acute coronary syndrome who have stable coronary disease or you have suspicion that they may have coronary disease or ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, the way we diagnose those patients by doing a stress test as well as echocardiogram. Echocardiogram is to assist the uh, function of uh, uh, systolic function of left ventricle and the stress test is to see the microbial ischemia. But these uh, tests we do in patients who are having acute coronary syndrome. So the EKG presentation of acute coronary syndrome, this patient having ST elevation microbial function, he has up to five millimeter ST elevation in lead two, three AVF, what we call inferior leads, as well as in V4 to V6, and has some ST depression in lead to V2, as well as V1. Um, so most likely this patient having uh, acute inferior lateral wall myocardial function 
since this wall, the wall, the lateral wall is most likely uh, happening in the distribution of the left circumflex artery. This patient having ST elevation, convex type of ST elevation, will lead to V1 to V5. So the way you can differentiate pupils who have ST elevation from patients who having ST elevation due to myocardial function, uh, the patient who having ST elevation micro function, their ST elevation is usually convex type and usually as, and most likely associated with the uh, reciprocal ST depression. So this patient having reciprocal ST depression in inferior leads along with ST elevation in lead V1 to V5. So this is considered uh, of having acute anterior septal wall micro function. There's also a elevation AV in lead AVL. So most likely this patient have for involvement of proximal LED as well as a diagonal branch. Uh, one more uh, EKG patient ST elevation microfunction. This patient having ST elevation up to two to three millimeters and lead V2, uh, V3, uh, V4, V5, and V6 and have a reciprocal ST depression, which is one of the criteria to diagnose ST elevation function. So he's having reciprocal ST depression, lead three in AVF. Uh, so this patient having acute anterior lateral wall function, most likely involving mid LED. Uh, this patient having ST elevation, mostly in lead two AVF, uh, some in lead three. Uh, he also have uh, reciprocal ST depression lead to V1 to V4. If you can see, patient have some tall R waves in lead V2, some R waves in lead to V1. So if you can flip the EKG uh, on the back side, you can see actually patient having ST elevation lead V1 to V2. So this patient having uh, acute inferior posterior wall micro function, which means he has a uh, Myocardial function involving the right ventricle. And the treatment is to revascularize, but also give him a lot of intravenous fluids. Sometimes patients don't come with ST elevation. Uh, they come with a complication of ST elevation myocardial function. Uh, this patient having a wide complex rhythm, uh, more than 120 millimeter in width, uh, has some P waves you can see in lead to the V3, some in lead to lead 3. Uh, so this is considered having ventricular tachycardia and most of the time patient, uh, this patient having uh, involvement of the proximal LED. Now, if you have oxalating type of QRS complex, a bizarre QRS complex in which you cannot determine the P wave or T wave, uh, then the, these kind of patient having ventricular fibrillation, they're always unstable, they probably have no blood pressure. Uh, and this is uh, mostly having patients who are having osteal or proximal LED. Now, some patients uh, comes with the Brady arrhythmia instead of tachyarrhythmia. Uh, this patient having complete heart block. If this uh, happen in the inferior wall myocardial function, then the treatment is temporary pacemaker. Most of the time, in acute inferior wall myocardial function, patient having acute vagal stimulation, what we call dissolved GRH reflex. Uh, and usually they improve with revascularization and temporary pacemaker. Now, this, if this patient's coming with acute anterior wall micro function, then most likely he will need to revascularization and permanent pacemaker. Some patients don't come with ST elevation, they come with new onset left corner branch block. So the patient coming with typical symptoms of angina associated with a new onset left corner branch block, then we call them having acute uh, ST7 elevation micro function, they should be taken immediately to cardiac cath lab. Overall prognosis is poor in those patients. If they already have existing uh, left corner branch block, then if the QRS complex is downward, then they should have five millimeter ST elevation in the discordant or downward deflected QRS complex and should have at least one millimeter ST elevation in the upright QRS complex. So the treatment, the immediate or uh, treatment in the ER, we uh, give them oxygen because uh, the myocardial function means that there's decreased oxygen supply to the heart. So you try to start to give them oxygen. Uh, to reduce the vagal stimulation, we give them uh, morphine uh, because when they are in severe pain, it causes vagal stimulation, which can cause bradycardia and hypertension. Uh, and we start them on antiplatelet therapy, such as aspirin and sometimes clopidogrel as well. Uh, 
if they're, if they are tachycardic and have adequate blood pressure, we also start them on beta blocker. And then you also want to start them on anticoagulation. Now, if the patient's coming with non ST segment elevation microfunction, sometimes we start them on the 2B3, such as Integralin or Agrostat or Repro, uh, in a, if you want to treat them medically initially. If you want to take them directly to cat lab, then you don't, should not start them on 2B3 inhibitors. So if you can see in the algorithm, patient having a, a non ST elevation on similar microfunction, uh, depends upon the, how uh, critical they are, we may treat them medically or take them to cardiac cath lab. If they're having ST elevation microfunction, we should take them immediately to cardiac cath lab. And the revascularization should be, should be uh, done within 90 minutes. So these are some medicine which I mentioned that they should be given people who having acute coronary syndrome. We give them aspirin, clopidogrel, prasagrel, and tricagrel are the new alternatives to clopidogrel. Uh, we like to give them patients who did not receive uh, thrombolytic therapy. Beta blockers should be given right away, uh, five milligram intravenously uh, 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 every uh, every five minutes. Uh, times three, and then we can start them on the oral beta blockers. Now, ACE inhibitors in the past, we thought should be given pupils who have uh, interior or microfunction associated with LV dysfunction, but now we, we think that every patient should receive ACE inhibitors unless there is some contraindication. Statins to reduce the plaque uh, burden, uh, and the statin also used to smoothen the rough edges of the plaque. Uh, so uh, it decreases the chances of future plaque rupture. Now, some of the complications, and there's also a slide which I'm presenting later, later on. Uh, some of the uh, uh, complications of acute microfunction include electrical dysfunction, which I mentioned before, such as bradycardia, uh, complete heart block, tachycardia, such as ventricular tachycardia, or VFib. Uh, they can uh, develop with, uh, come with the cardiomyopathy or pseudoaneurysm or cardiogenic shock, and they can have uh, microvegetation. So this is a slide I want to show you. So in early mechanical complications, in the late mechanical complication after acute coronary syndrome. So early mechanical complication mean they occurs within 24 hours up to seven days. And the late complication happens after, you know, up to seven days to three months after the myocardial function. So uh, early mechanical complications, the first one is ventricular septal rupture, uh, can happen within 24 hours up to seven days. Uh, so typically those patients uh, have murmur, but not always murmur, but they usually have cardiogenic shock, which means that they are hypotensive tachycardic, uh, and uh, they do not have a congestive heart failure. Uh, peppery muscle rupture patients uh, usually have a patient with me who have acute inferior wall microfunction, and they usually develop uh, acute microvegetation. Those patients have hypotension, to tachycardia, as well as uh, congestive heart failure. They may or may not have murmur. So the way you differentiate between ventricular septal rupture and peppery muscle dysfunction is that uh, ventricular septal rupture patients do not have congestive heart failure. Peppery muscle dysfunction patients do have congestive heart failure. Uh, sometimes they come with free wall rupture. Uh, those patients have, uh, when you do the echo, they have pericardial diffusion and uh, they have, can develop electrical mechanical dissociation right away. They can die usually right away. This usually does happen to patients who have only single vessel disease and uh, unable to revascularize or they do revascularize with the late thrombolytic therapy. Late mechanical complications include uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, which means LV dysfunction. Uh, they can develop uh, 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 true aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm. True aneurysm means that uh, uh, there is an area of, uh, of dilatation in the wall of the, uh, uh, wall of the uh, vessel of the ventricle, uh, which also contain myocardium. Pseudoaneurysm, they do not have myocardium, they only have pericardium. So after you treat the patient, revascularize the patient, and start them with medical therapy, then it comes the preventive cardiology, which means to prevent future cardiac event. And the way we can do that is, uh, is uh, by modifying the risk factor, which cause 
injury to the wall of the vessel and increase the risk of uh, atherosclerosis. So the, the, some of the risk factors which can cause include smoking, hypertension, high cholesterol, physical inactivity, obesity, um, and uh, diabetes mellitus. Um, so uh, we want uh, their blood pressure to be at least below 140 systolic and the diastole should be below 90. Um, and uh, in pupils who have uh, existing diabetes or uh, hypertension or a uh, kidney condition, then those patients, we want the blood pressure to be around 120 over 80. Uh, so the, for the lipids, uh, the D guidelines suggest that LDL should be below 70, uh, HDL should be above 45, and total cholesterol should be below uh, 200, and triglycerides should be below 150. Um, and then, um, so, in in uh, in your terminology, the LDL should be below 1.8 millimolt, HDL should be below 1.2. I'm sorry, it should be above 1.2 millimoles, and the triglyceride should be below 1.5 millimoles. Um, obesity, obesity, and overweight, uh, they should have a body mass index. Uh, between 20 to 25. So the way we measure the body mass index is uh, patient's weight in kilogram divided by their height in meters. And if the number between 20 to 25, they are in adequate condition. If their BMI is above 25, uh, then they should lose weight. So BMI between 25 to 30 consider uh, overweight, about 30 consider obese, about 35 consider uh, morbid obesity. So those patients should need to lose weight. Physical inactivity, we suggest uh, uh, cardiovascular exercise 30 minutes three times a week or 10 minutes per day. Uh, cardiovascular exercise uh, such as uh, uh, brisk walking, uh, jogging, uh, running, uh, uh, and uh, taking stairs, uh, any of those uh, activities which increase the heart rate uh, consider physical cardiovascular exercise. Uh, weightlifting is not a cardiovascular exercise, it's an isotonic exercise we don't recommend initially in the first three months. Uh, diabetes mellitus uh, should have a strict control. In the past, we were very strict. We thought the uh, hemoglobin A1C should be below 6.5, but now the data suggests that it should be below 7. Um, and uh, as I said, that the cholesterol plaque rupture, which can cause acute coronary syndrome, we usually have in pupils who are overexerting themselves, physically exerting or physically overexerting themselves or in a lot of emotional stress. So try to minimize your stress uh, in your life. So I'm gonna do some quick questions. Do you have time to do questions? Or, yeah, I'm pretty much on time. So uh, what is the proper use of using sublingual nitro blood stream? So use uh, one sublingual nitro blood stream when, when chest pain occurs, if present, use second tablet within five minutes and use third tablet within three to five minutes. Uh, if still present, uh, five minutes and, and, and go to emergency room. The second choice, the use of lingual nitroglycine and angina occurs and then call 911. Uh, so the answer is uh, A, uh, you could use sublingual nitroglycine every five minutes times three. Um, and if, if uh, 20 minutes gone, uh, so you uh, the pain is there for five minutes, you use first, first seven of the night to restrain. And the last will be after 20 minutes and the pain's still there, then the patient should go to emergency room for immediate evaluation. So which of the following is not a mechanism of beta blockers? So decreasing heart rate and decreased oxygen demand, decreased contractility, which decreases oxygen demand, lowering blood pressure, which decreases LD pressure, in turn decreasing wall stress. And D is to increase oxygen supply by RTL with the dilatation. So the, uh, and the answer is D. This is not the mechanism of beta blocker. All three above are the mechanism of beta blocker. Um, which of the following therapy is not in patient for, from coronary vasospasm? Uh, so this is the uh, uh, patient who having Prince metal angina. So, uh, a is a calcium channel blocker such as uh, amlodipine, nifedipine. B is uh, deltazem, verapamol. C is beta blockers. D is long acting nitroglycerin, uh, long acting nitrates. So the answer is beta block. We don't give uh, uh, beta blockers in patient uh, with uh, coronary vasospasm. 
especially non-selectivated blood pressure, not weakening in those patients. The question four, which of the following best describe the most common pathophysiologic mechanism present during ST elevation micro function? Uh, corneal plaque erosion, corneal plaque rupture, corneal plaque progression causing progressive stenosis, corneal vasospasms. So I, uh, uh, if you hear very well my uh, talk, I says the most common mechanism is corneal plaque rupture. Uh, it usually happens to pupils above the age of 40. Uh, and if they come in with acute macular function, most of the time they have corneal plaque rupture. Patients who come with macular function below Below the age of 40, they usually have corny plaque erosion. Uh, and uh, if the patient's above the age of 70, they usually have corny plaque progression uh, with progressive stenosis uh, resulting in microfunction. Corny vasospasm happen to people who have Prince Trental in general. Uh, last question, which of the following murmurs can be heard on a physiologic exam patient with acute microfunction? The answer is, uh, uh, is uh, Number C, which means S3, uh, which happened patient with acute macular function. So my email address is s y e d m a s h o d a h n e d at hotmail.com. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, thank you and good luck.